G'day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Fight for Success podcast. Today, I'm joined by Connor. Connor, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks, mate. I appreciate you having me on. Awesome, mate. So, mate, just for the audience, uh, just for a quick 30 seconds, who's who's Connor? Yeah, so my name's Connor O'Shea. I'm a mobility and rehab coach. I'm from Ireland. I'm 34, and I have lived overseas for over nine years now. Awesome. So where where, are you, where have you been living? So I was in Asia for two years. Then I was in Australia, where we would have crossed paths for six years. And now I'm back in Europe. So I'm actually currently in Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Nice. How do you how do you think Europe's changed in the last nine years then? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I guess I'm experiencing it because uh, I haven't seen a lot of it because I was very excited to see, you know, the other side of the world, like Asia and Australia. So I've never been to Tenerife before. So this is all a new kind of experience. And I'm going to go to Eastern Europe in the next few months as well. So these it'll be all new experiences but i guess the big thing about europe is everything is very close in comparison yep. to, to australia so that's kind of the big i guess positive difference in, in that sense yeah that's it mate and it's it's funny because like when uh, i speak to europeans they, they always want to go over and do you know years and years in australia and then you speak to australians and they want to do years and years in europe um yeah. I, I actually spent four years backpacking europe uh so i went basically yeah. all over all over europe um, I think the only countries I haven't been to in Europe now are Ukraine um, and Andorra. The little speck. oh wow, you little been to sp- everywhere, yeah, everywhere, yeah. <laughs> so all the other countries I've been to, um, and yeah, I spent four years just backpacking, going from hostel to hostel, uh, just right, just living it up. <laughs> Where was your favorite place? Uh, it's a it's a hard question to answer because obviously the, there's so many like awesome cultures and awesome places to visit in Europe. But um, my favorite place out of everywhere was um, probably Estonia or, um, and I'm not just saying this because I know you're Irish, but Ireland um, (laughs) or maybe even Russia, like as much like I know Russia, you know, is kind of Asia and and Europe, but um, Russia was like a really uh, eye opening experience for me because you listen to the media and the media talks a lot about, you know, about Russia. And when I got there and actually learned and met with Russian people and uh, walked around the cities and everything else, I realized that it was, a, it was a real like pretty safe place. I, the people were quite friendly. Um, they had that kind of Russian, um, a, you know, w- I guess wall up to them. As soon as you go up and meet them, they, you know, they're very Russian, but as soon as you get past that and get to know them, they're just, you know, everyday people that uh, just love their country and uh, just living their life. And they're really hospitable people. So um, that was one of the most eye-opening places was uh, actually Russia. So, Yeah. I think that's the great thing about travel as well. Like you realize people are people wherever yeah. you go, you know, regardless of what the media is saying about it. Yeah. That's it. So I saw you did uh, the other day a, a big hike up a mountain um, in Tenerife. So what happened there? Yeah, so there's a, it's called Mount Tide in Tenerife. It's the highest mountain in Spain. It's 3,700 meters above sea level, so almost four kilometers above sea level. Yep. And I met a Dutch guy. I was doing a tour. There's like a, a stargazing tour two weeks ago. Tenerife is very famous because it's in the middle of the ocean. It's just off the west coast of Africa. So it's very isolated. There's very little light uh pollution and it's famous to go stargazing so i went on that tour and it was you know really fantastic stars and then he said he's going uh on a a nighttime hike at the weekend and basically the reason people do a a nighttime hike is you can see sunrise but also you actually need a permit to climb the mountain uh during the day and mm. if you wanted to hike during the day, you'd need to apply for the permit over a year in advance because it's very popular. So the other option is to do a hike at night because mm. they don't start until nine o'clock. So that was the idea behind it. So we set off at like half two in the morning and it was about four and a half hours to the top. Uh, got up at about seven, seven thirty for sunrise. And yeah, it was amazing. Like I've never been that high in, in my life. And 
it's very like the altitude was quite challenging on the lungs you can really feel how yeah you know more gassed you get with that sort of level above sea level Mm. Uh, but it was really yeah lovely experience because like it's all dark on the way up you're enjoying the stars and then you get to see sunrise and on the way down it's bright so it's like a new experience on the way down as well so yeah lovely thing to do and you know it's just a free activity which is generally being out in nature is like it's always you're never going to regret doing something like that it's always a nice feeling and being physically challenging as well as a good thing yeah, that's it. Yeah, the altitude sickness is, um, it's an interesting feeling, isn't it? Because uh, when I was in Nepal, I did the Everest Base Camp trek. Um, so that goes up to, I think, five. So I think Everest Base Camps are 5,600 above sea level. Um, but the, oh, wow. day be- the day before to acclimatize, you walk up a different amount. I forget the name of it. But that goes up to, I think, 5,900 above sea level. Um, and yeah, that was a that was pretty, um, you know, any- anywhere above that three and a half thousand, you really start feeling it in the lungs but once you get to that 5000 mark i was just getting the worst headaches like like every time i put a f- my foot on the ground i just feel the back of my head just go like boing, boing, boing like every step yeah. it was a, yeah it was a tough tough experience but it was amazing like being out in the nature um seeing the himalayas like all that kind of stuff it's just it's a really amazing experience that i think everyone should do so yeah yeah definitely. So maybe let's get back to, uh, you know, what, what you do. Um, so you were, yeah, was it a mobility and fitness coach, was it? Yeah, so I'm a mobility and rehab coach. That's, yep. that's basically what I do, yeah. Cool. And is, is there like a, a specific type of um, niche that you work in with any like different body parts or types of people? Or Yeah, so I specifically work with guys over 30 who want to get strong, lean and pain-free without wasting hours at the gym each week or trying to figure it out each week. And I guess one of the biggest issues that I come across with, with my clients or with people who are interested in, in working with me or looking for help is overwhelm and trying to figure out what to do because there's so much noise in fitness, I guess, in, in all industries now on the internet. And it can be very difficult to know how to distill the information into something that's going to work for your individual situation, for your lifestyle and be able to implement it in a sustainable way as well so that's Mm. kind of where i come in i uh, pull it into like a really succinct way so we can put it into the person's lifestyle um so you know most of them are they're busy they're running businesses or they're busy jobs families you know they have a lot going on so dedicating you know eight ten hours a week to research and all this kind of stuff is just not feasible and the reality is most people will quit before they get any sort of results doing it that way as well and do you, do you specialize in any specific uh, body parts or it's just um you know men over 30s that are just trying to make themselves stronger like do you, do you specialize abs. in backs or knees or just abs just abs, <laughs> all all abs. abs. yeah <laughs> <laughs> Just get, thousand get, crunches like, a day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> but yeah, generally it's um a lot of people come to me for lower back issues, knee issues, and shoulders would be kind of the, the kind of big three. And that's the main stuff. Like from an like aesthetics wouldn't be really something I would be dealing with, but generally that's like a positive offset of the, the work that we'll do together is when you rehab injuries, you create a sustainable consistent training routine Mm. you dial in your your food the positive knock-on effect is you're going to look better as well because you've kind of got the fundamentals down pat and it's all about just what i like to say is like picking the low-hanging fruit so all the low-hanging fruit in someone's environment we just pick all that so it's not like a huge over overhaul in their lifestyle it's just optimizing all the little things and that tends to compound over time and gets mm. people fantastic results as a, as a result of that. Yeah. Cause I think that that's probably one of the biggest issues when people decide, you know, the new year, new me or whatever you want to call it. Um, they'll start a new diet or a new fitness program. And it's just so different to what their normal life is like that they're not going to stick to it. Right. They they've gone from not working out at all, sitting on a couch too much or, generally sitting down too much um, and maybe just eating really terrible foods to then going, all right, as of tomorrow, I'm going to work out twice a day, five days a week. I'm going to eat chicken and broccoli. And within by Friday next week, I'm going to be over it and eating ice cream. So. (laughs) 
Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's it's a difficult one because the longer you kind of go down a path that you're not happy with and you're like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, you can feel yourself, you know, getting out of shape, gaining weight, feeling less healthy. You might go up the stairs and you're getting out of breath and then your back is sore after, you know, a few hours of work in the garden. The longer that goes on for it, the more extreme that you feel you need to, the change to be. So you're like, OK, like I'm going to have one more weekend and then I'm going to be super strict from Monday and, you know, it's going to be OK. And then what happens is you just can't sustain this massive shift or change that you're trying to create for your body. Mm. And the reality is it, it kind of makes it feel better to be on a, a pattern of maybe poor quality food, poor quality diet and, and training or lack of training. If you keep telling yourself, I'm going to make a big shift in January or on mm. Monday. But the reality is that's not sustainable. It's not, you can't adhere to that over the long term. And it's about learning how to fit something into your life that you can actually show up and do consistently, you know, not for six to eight weeks, but you're looking at how to implement this for, for years. And the only way you can do that is to make it easy, yep. which is kind of hard for people to get their head around because, I've done so little. I need to make a. I need to do loads now over the next few months to actually see a shift. But that's a waste of time if you can't sustain it. Yep. And with the with the back issues, like the lower back issues, do you do you feel that's mostly just because people are generally sitting down too much these days? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a kind of acute injuries and overuse injuries. So, like an acute injury is you fall and you you hurt your back. Uh, so it's like an impact or you're doing BJJ or football or whatever. Um, and then overuse is just kind of repeated patterns and it just starts wearing down. So mm. in my experience, I'm not dealing with athletes. I'm dealing with everyday people who are generally sedentary working, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. So it's generally uh, excessive sitting and just poor quality positions. And we have to look at ourselves like currently, even though if you're sitting all day, you're, you're normal in today's world, we're actually living very abnormal lives for humans. Yeah. We're not mm -hmm. in like built to be just sedentary for 12, 14 hours a day and doing 30 minutes of movement. So what happens when you sit a lot is your, your core gets very weak, your glutes get very weak, and you basically atrophy in all the areas to give you stability, which keeps your back in a, in a safe position and your pelvis in a good position as well um and your body gets very tight through the front so like the front of your hips your abdominal area your chest gets very tight the back side of your body so your glutes your hamstrings your lower back your upper back gets very uh, weak mm. and as a result of that all the stability just kind of disappears and you start getting pain and generally the lower back is kind of the, the scapegoat that's kind of where everything tends to go and it overcompensates and as a result of that you start getting that pain so for people listening like just a really simple thing that you can start practicing is strengthening the back side of your body and mm. stretching the front side of your body so stretching like your hip flexors and your chest uh stretching your hip flexors and your chest and strengthening like your glutes and your middle upper back area like yeah. if you're just to think about the easiest program in the world that's going to make you feel better that would be what you'd be focusing on. Yeah. Yeah. Cause obviously if you're sitting down way too much, you know, your glutes are getting weaker, your thighs are getting weaker, your quads, your, you know, hammies, your calves, everything, everything's getting weaker because you're not using it as much. And then generally when you try and sit up, you see people lean forward to, um, to sit up rather than using those glutes and legs to actually lift themselves up. So is that rep repetitive, um, like this bad posture while you're trying to sit up, can that, cause the strain which will cause lower back problems in the future yeah and it's just kind of not having a huge amount of variety in the positions that you're spending your time in so when i was living in i lived in asia for two years and you'd see people in their 70s and 80s and they moved so well they would mm. sit on the ground they'd squat you know perfectly because they never stopped doing these positions whereas in a lot of Western countries, after we get into school, we kind of never go, go back on the ground again. So mm. we get out of bed, we sit in a chair, we sit in the car, we sit at the table for, for breakfast, dinner. 
we sit all day at work and then we sit on the couch at, at home and then we go back to bed. So mm. your hips aren't going through full range ever. And the funny thing is the more, if you just start implementing it gently now, you know, in one or two or three years, you'll have full function back into your hips, which will have a dramatic impact on how your back feels, how your body feels in general. <clears throat> so a lot of times it's, it's, it's quite simple environmental shifts, but the reality is the world that we're living is in is set up for you to never really get on the ground mm. or change the positions that you're in. Uh, so you just have to be a bit more conscious about how you're setting up your environment something simple like a lot of people are working from home now still so you might instead of just sitting at the desk all day you might change the levels so you might spend most of your day sitting but then you might spend maybe an hour out of the day standing and that mm. could be like four 15 minute blocks throughout the day and you might spend four 15 minute blocks sitting like on the floor uh, like at a coffee table doing doing that and then you'll start just incrementally building up those times that you sit on the ground and stand as well so eventually it might be you know three like 30 percent of the day in each position not just all the time sitting yeah yeah it was one thing that i noticed when i was in kind of like southeast asia i'd see a lot of people when they when they were squatting just to be you know just chilling out and relaxing they their heels would be perfectly on the ground and they can just sit in a like a perfect squat but usually when you see people in Western world that, you know, do sit way too much and do have sedentary, sedentary occupations, when they squat, they're on their tippy toes and they're leaning forward a lot more. So it is, it, it is just like, is that a, is that a genetic thing or is that just because of the way we live our lives? Yeah, it, it's kind of both options. Like I think there are different um, nationalities or like Northern Europeans tend to be just stiffer, in general and like a lot of will say australians would be kind of of northern european descent as well mm. so but then it's also like environmentally like i'm a perfect example when i was in my mid-20s i'm 34 now i was stiff as a board loads of injuries couldn't sit on the ground couldn't really squat properly and now i've just been kind of living day to day like sitting on the ground more focusing on squatting more throughout the day versus just doing an hour session at the gym and mm. my body has opened up dramatically so it, you can imagine and then if you look at like a preschool child regardless of their race or where they're from in the world they move perfectly yeah like, it's crazy their movement is, <laughs> is, is is amazing so yeah. a lot of it is just like you 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 get good at what you practice you know, so if you're practicing sitting all day for like literally decades, well, you get really good at that and you get really bad at sitting on the ground or squatting. If you look at someone's behavior in somewhere like Southeast Asia, they might be using a squat toilet. They're sitting on the ground. They might be eating a lot of meals on the ground. So they get really good, good at that. And it's mm -hmm. excellent for maintaining their mobility, especially as they age. And this is a huge point is that there's a massive correlation between all cause mortality and falls as we age in particular in the west so basically as you get over 60 70 if you haven't been on the ground in 20 or 30 years if you have an issue where you actually end up falling you can you know crack a hip or put yourself back and this is one of the highest determinants of actually people going downhill very quickly as they age and having to go into like full-time care you know losing all their autonomy and independence so it's one of the most kind of powerful things you can start working on now. And like, if you're listening to this and you're in your forties or fifties or your sixties and you're like, Jesus, I can't get up and down off the ground comfortably. I mean, it's something you can start working on now because if you can't do it in your forties or fifties, it's not going to get better into your sixties and seventies. Mm. And it will literally dramatically increase your risk of going downhill quickly as you age. Yeah. Wow. Well, okay. So have, do, do you generally work with um, older clients where we've seen this kind of shift where they've deteriorated a lot quicker because of just inactivity throughout their life? My oldest client is, uh, she's 69. She mm. can do handstands still. Nice. So she's amazing. I'm actually going to talk to her just after this call, but um, I don't deal with that age group like 70s and above but just the, that's what the research says and yeah. like a lot of all of my training is around longevity around like i want 
for my own self personally, it's like I want to be able to move really well into my 80s. I don't want to be restricted. I want to be, you know, have my my body basically be able to basically the, the term I like to use is from GMB Fitness is called physical autonomy. So basically, whatever it is that is valuable to you, you want your body to be able to do that for you. So mm-hmm. I mean, for you, it might be able to be, you know, uh, competing in in BJJ and all of these things as you, uh, uh, you know, for the next yep. decade or more, and probably to be able to do, you know, 10 hour days if you need to without being in chronic neck and shoulder pain yeah for someone else might be able to be you know to be able to play with their kids in the ground and and run in the park and hang out off monkey monkey rings or whatever for someone else might be able to do one arm handstand like it depends what is you know subjectively important to the individual mm. um but you know bringing back to your question around people you know specifically training for uh, older population I train people so when they get to that age, they're going to be in the best possible position mm. going forwards. Yeah. I mean, if you, let's say you're having a chat with someone who hasn't trained in years, right? They've been very inactive. They're working a sedentary occupation. They sit on the couch a lot. Um, they haven't been, you know, doing 10,000 steps or anything like that. So they've been very inactive. What's something that you would recommend those kinds of people to do to start their fitness or um, you know, their journey to get back to an active lifestyle. Cause you see, you know, you obviously hear people that are in that situation and they jump on a treadmill or something and sprint and then do their hamstring or something like that. Like what's the kind of process you would take to get that person back into a, a fit, a fit routine. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm obviously biased, like, you know, getting a coach, I think is massively powerful, but like, let's just say someone is listening to this. They, let's just say it's a 50 year old guy. He hasn't done anything in 20 years and he's really feeling it now. And he has no idea even where to start. And he, he's not in a position where he wants to get, you know, get a PT or get go to classes or whatever, but he just wants to get some sort of benefits. So the first thing I would say is set your weekly minimum that you're going to start committing uh, with your, with your training, with your investment to train each week. So what I recommend is that instead of, joining a a challenge and doing like six days a week and it's really you know motivating and it's a big thing to do Uh, and then you end up just dropping off and the whole thing's a waste of time set your weekly floor so say like okay over the next year i'm actually going to show up every single week regardless of what's going on and i like to tell people like imagine your hell week where like everything's going wrong family finances business it's all burning what can you still show up and do that week it's generally two 15 minute sessions for most mm. people I talk to. So let's just say you set your weekly floors two 15 minute sessions. Now that might be two 15 minute walks, which is totally fine. It doesn't have to be anything crazy because all we're focusing on is developing the habit and routine of showing up and doing movement every single week going forwards. The great thing about this is that when you start building a consistent routine, that's when you get great results because Mm. we can actually start layering on top of that habit over time. And from a, like what to do, I would probably recommend like looking at gmb.io. These are the guys that I've learned a huge amount of stuff from just search them. They've got hundreds, if not thousands of videos, and you could just do like a a 10 to 15 minute routine from them. And it's just going to be a really gentle mobility work, focusing on helping, you know, improving your wrist mobility your hip mobility or, your core strength and that's it you know just mm. set, set your weekly floor do less but do it more frequently is the yep. big thing as well and don't think that you're i mean stop thinking in 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 six six week challenges if you're 50 now and you haven't done anything in 20 years like it's going to take time but you're going to be so much better off doing it now than when you're 60 when mm. you're 60 you're going to be like shit I, I should have started when i was 50 you know yeah so yes. that would be kind of uh, the way I would start with stuff and um, try and get more sleep as well. That's a big one. What, what we talk about a lot with clients is instead of just saying, yeah, just try and get more sleep. We look at their wind down. So we kind of reverse engineer the, the experience we're trying to get. So instead of just saying, you know, sleep eight hours and then someone's in bed at 11 o'clock and their eyes are wide open and they can't sleep. We look at their wind downs of the hour before bed. We look at just shutting off electronics, you know, shutting off all of those things that are going to really wire the nervous system and 
you can also do like a brain dump so just journal all the what anxieties and everything you have in your head get that all down on paper and then it's going to be easier to sleep and then in the morning try and get an a, kind of like a consistent wake up time every morning as well so whatever that is maybe a 7 a.m and then over time your sleep will start regulating and you'll find it easier to sleep over time because if you're exhausted all the time you're going to crave refined sugars carbohydrates you're going to be tired your risk of injury is going to go up so it's just again a very easy low-hanging fruit that you can use that's going to give you massive return um, mm. and it's a small thing to change yeah okay uh, that's really good advice and um like what mate, what is it that keeps you inspired to keep keep going down this path with the um kind of rehab focus for for men above 30 what, what is it that keeps you inspired I guess just my clients, I, I love, like I'm so lucky the, the work I get to do, the people I get to connect with each week and just seeing that a lot of the times that the, what I'm talking about a lot recently is like the difference between going shallow and wide versus narrow and deep with your energy. And when you go narrow and deep with stuff, you get, it's not like you're putting in more effort or time, but you're getting way better outcomes. So someone could have been really, you know, putting in lots of effort, trying lots of different things, but they're going just kind of wide and shallow with everything. And then when they come into the program or they just are working with someone or they have a routine that's actually going laser focus on what they need, they just get a huge return on their time invested and they get way better outcomes. So it's just trying to spread that to more people and empower more people that it, it doesn't have to be the way it currently is. Like if you're in pain, you've got injuries, like I know how it feels. I spent a lot of the last decade in pain and it can cause a lot of worry, even anxiety around your, you know, your future. Like, am I going to be able to do my job? Am I going to be able to travel with my family? Am I able to go to play with my kids? All these things. So it can feel that it's only going to go downhill, but you also need to understand that you probably haven't been doing the right things to date. And when you have a proper roadmap and plan, it's going to be a lot easier to get things back on track and get much better results. So I guess it's just the motivation to kind of spread the word to more people that they can really dramatically improve their situation without a massive overhaul and without a huge amount of extra effort a lot of times as well. Hmm. Okay. And mate, because you're, you're, you just do online coaching. Is, is that how yours works? So what, what would you say to someone who um, hasn't tried online coaching before and doesn't really understand how online coaching would actually help them in their, their goals or whatever? What, what's something, what, what's something would you would say to someone like that? Yeah, I think the great way to look at online coaching, it's kind of like before the pandemic where every business was like never going to be a remote business. And it was never going to work. And then all of a sudden they all moved online and they were like, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> so that's kind of just, I guess, having an open mind. Uh, what I've noticed since I've moved my clientele or my client base completely online over the last two and a half years is it actually gives people more autonomy because there is, you're not going to be getting your hand held 100% of the time. But when I was fully in person, people would come and train with me, you know, one, two, three, even four times a week, but they wouldn't really do anything else themselves. It was more like, Oh, I'll just come in. I'll see Connor. And then I can just forget about everything for the rest of the week. Hmm. Whereas with online people are basically, it's kind of like teaching people to fish versus giving them a fish every week. Hmm. So they're, they're kind of building the tools to of, around accountability and of showing up for themselves. They have the roadmap and I'm keeping them accountable through online methods, but they're actually going to be better capable to continue on themselves whenever they decide to leave the program. Hmm. So that would be kind of the big shift I've seen. And if you told, you know, if, if I was talking to you three or four years ago about doing rehab coaching online, I would have said like, you know, that's not going to work man like i don't know what you're what you're talking about but when you look at things environmentally you realize that a lot of the issues are it's not necessarily like of course the training program that you're doing is potentially harming you sometimes hmm. if you're doing like the insanity workout or you know some crazy hit thing that you just aren't in a position to be able to do safely 
But then also, if we just look at like, how are you spending your day and we start optimizing your movement throughout the day, we see massive shifts in how you feel through your shoulders, through your lower back and through your hips and knees as well. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And so with your programs, you, you write out a program for them and they go to the gym and do it themselves. Is that, is that how it works? It's all individualized. So yep. like depending on the person's situation. So I have clients who have, you know, they train at a fully kitted out gym. I've got clients who, especially like a lot of my clientele are still in Melbourne and a lot of them would have trained in an apartment with zero equipment for over two years you know, mm. with, with the lockdowns and everything like that. Um, of course, if there's more equipment, there's more options, but my kind of speciality is body weight training, minimalistic training approaches. And the program is all about meeting the person where they're at, taking into account their current level, their restrictions, their limitations, their access to equipment and their goals going forwards. Yeah. Okay. So like, obviously, um, you know, people who may have never tried online coaching before might be listening to this. And one of the questions they might have is um, what if I'm doing the technique wrong and you're not watching how, how do you manage people like that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a really common question as well. And the program is really built out from building a base with the fundamentals. And I've had you know, clients who are in their 50s or 60s who haven't actually trained before. And we started off doing very basic fundamental movements. Um, and then it's not like every month you're getting a new bunch of random exercises. You do the next level of that variation. So what I like to explain things is like you've got human movements in training. And like just to give people a quick overview, you have like a pushing movement, a pulling movement, a squatting movement, a hinging movement, and a core exercise. So let's just say there are five different ladders. And let's just say we're starting at the first step of the pushing ladder. So that might be like a push up off your knees or a push up on the wall. Hmm. And, you know, from a technique point of view, it's pretty easy. If you're still struggling with that technique, then you can send through videos for feedback, or I can even critique it on, you know, we do weekly calls as well in the group. Oh, yeah. And then basically every month you're going to the next step on that ladder. So it's not like you're, you did a pushing movement last month and next month you're doing it just a random exercise that doesn't make sense. It's like the next variation of that movement. So mechanically, like the program's been designed specifically for people who don't have a good movement base, because this is a problem that I was running into in-person coaching and online coaching even more so. So that's how the program has been de um, designed to make it much easier to build for, for people who are remote as well. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. That, that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> mate, if you could change one thing about the fitness industry, I'm sure you can probably think of a few things, but what's the one thing that you would like to change about the fitness industry? I think I would like to get more information in front of people around going slower and being more consistent because it's a difficult one because you can put on like a, you know, I, I love David Goggins, but, he kind of makes you think that you need to walk, run through walls to, <laughs> you know, to get results. And most of us, myself included, my body will just break mm. if I do what he does. So I would say, you know, people kind of come to me. I'm not the first person that they go and see. I'm like number eight or nine, probably a lot of the times, uh, because they've just realized that the other options aren't going to work sustainably so i guess yeah just kind of realizing like this isn't it's not a fad it's this is not this is your life basically you need yeah. to train for the life that you want so if you have a job or a relationship and you show up for 30 to 60 percent or 50 percent of the year you're i mean you're going to fail you yeah know, it's going to be a disaster and your training is no different so the only way you can show up 80 90 100 percent of the time is to make it easier to do less but do it better mm. no it's good advice yeah D david goggins <clears throat> he's a it's an interesting um story of his isn't it have you read his book no i haven't <clears throat> i haven't but like i've seen you know i've seen him on podcasts and yeah it's just also i think real understanding that we're on instagram and on youtube you're kind you're seeing the one percent you're not like, it can, you can think sometimes that this is what, this is normal. Like yeah. everyone is like absolutely shredded and beautiful. <laughs> like that's not the real world. That's like yeah. 1% of the world. 
so also just understanding like you don't need to be like that you're you're we're, we're not going to be like that because yeah. that's just unattainable um so doing what's going to work best for you which is yep. doing less but doing it more frequently yeah the it's interesting because like you look at some um you know fitness trainers and you go on their instagram and go wow this person is like absolutely shredded but they don't even look like that most of the time yeah. they you know they they go through like a six week or eight week training program and cut weight and you know pull out all the water and get a crazy tan and everything to to look like that get a whole bunch of photos and then recycle photos for a long time um and so you see them in the gym and you're like you don't even look like the person in the instagram <laughs> I've, <laughs> yeah. I've seen that so many times so <laughs> yeah it's really funny like especially online like you just need to get really ripped once and yeah. just <laughs> that's, that's it, it. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I need to do now, actually, I think is just, yeah, go it's going to get like the abs, man. <laughs> crazy water cleanse for like two or three weeks. And yeah, just take loads of photos. And yeah, that's it. Get loads, get loads of clients that way. <laughs> You'll blow up overnight. <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, I've, um, I really appreciate you jumping on. Um, you know, you've obviously got a lot of expertise, which I think um, people will be able to, you know, get a lot from this episode. And um, if they want to get in touch with you to find out a little bit more about your programs, um, where can they, where can they find you? Yeah, probably Instagram or Facebook is the easiest way to contact me. Uh, so Instagram at Connor O'Shea Fit, C-O-N-O-R-O-S-H-E-A-F-I-T, just Connor O'Shea on Facebook or Connor O'Shea Fitness.com as well. Okay, awesome. Did you have a, a Facebook group as well? Yes. Yeah, I've got a, face, a free Facebook group as well called Mobility Mastery. And I do lots of free trainings on hip, shoulder, you know, lower back issues um, and some nutritional habit advice as well. So yeah, um, we can definitely connect through there as well as lots of free info for people. Yeah, awesome. And um, just for the viewers, I am part of um, Connor's group as well. And it is actually really good, valuable information. So definitely encourage you to jump on that, uh, that group. And um, yeah, there's a lot of value adding stuff in there. So it's really good. Really, I've, I've been part of a few different fitness groups and I've, I've left them quite quickly. So <laughs> oh, that's good to hear, man. I'm glad yeah. to get the value out of it. Awesome, mate. Well, thanks for jumping on. Um, yeah. If anyone wants to get in touch with Connor, just um, I'll put the details in the show notes and um, yeah. Thanks again for jumping on, mate. Appreciate it, mate. Awesome.